This is the last Sunday in 2020. I am so excited that this year is over. It's been quite a year. As we start this morning, let's look at some of the highlights and mostly the lowlights of the year. January 26th, Kobe Bryant dies in a helicopter crash along with his 13-year-old daughter, Guyana. March 11th, the World Health Organization declares a global pandemic. May 25, George Floyd dies as a police officer applies the knee to the neck chokehold restraint. August 16, lightning storms spark deadly wildfires from California to Washington, burning millions of acres, displacing hundreds of thousands of people. September 18, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies at, 60, at 87. October 26, the U.S. Senate confirms Amy Coney Barrett to replace Ginsburg. November 7, Joe Biden is projected as the winner of the 2020 presidential election. December 14, coronavirus vaccines begin to roll out in the United States and around the world. Along with these world-changing events in 2020, a whole new everyday vocabulary has been learned and developed. Words like shelter in place, stay at home orders, lockdown, coronavirus, COVID-19, N95 mask, social distancing, false positive, second wave, asymptomatic, pandemic, CDC, community spread, droplet transmission, super spreader event, flattening the curve, PPE, ventilator, quarantine, and contact tracing. This vocabulary has become so familiar that even elementary school children are able to define most, if not all, of these words and phrases. But we have learned much more. We have learned to appreciate our medical community first responders and essential workers in unprecedented ways. We have also, by the way, learned and developed a whole new social etiquette. As a consequence, Lily Post, the great, great, great granddaughter of Emily Post, who wrote the book Etiquette, has had to add a new chapter. The chapter is entitled The Etiquette of Social Distancing During the COVID-19 Pandemic. It's not in the book per se, it's online. There are sections on Zoom editing, pandemic weddings, and social distancing manners in public spaces. I think I really need to look at the one on Zoom etiquette Along with learning new things, we have also relearned or been reminded of old truths. As I sought a couple of weeks ago to articulate some of these old truths, it struck me that in the nine months before and in the dark days after baby Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph were confronting many of these same truths. So before looking at the truths themselves, let's make sure that we have the whole Christmas story before us, especially that part uh, that we often overlook or pass by. It's found in Matthew 2, beginning 
with the 11th verse. It's the darker side of the story. On entering the house, the wise men saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for this child to destroy him. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and, he sent and killed all the children around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Herod the Great was a cruel and paranoid leader who not only killed all of those innocent children in Bethlehem, but fearing a family conspiracy, he killed two of his own wives, a mother-in-law, and three of his sons. If King Herod had you in his sight, getting out of town was a really good idea. The song that Jess just beautifully sang for us is a lullaby composed to be sung imaginatively by the mother of one of the children in Bethlehem who is slain. Following the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary traveled back, traveling back to their hometown in Nazareth was more than likely their plan. But being warned by the angel in this dream of Joseph, instead they escaped the terror of Herod by going south to Egypt. The couple heeded the warning and they changed their plans. In the face of threatening circumstances, Mary and Joseph discovered the value of flexibility. Their ability to change and adapt saved baby Jesus from death, from the terror of the tyrant Herod. For us in 2020, as for Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus back in the first century, the ability to adapt, change, and to be flexible has been critical. This has been a really tough year. Businesses and even some churches are closing permanently. The Christian Post est estimates that one in five churches will not survive the pandemic. We as a church will survive because we have been flexible. Yelp says that 800 businesses a day are closing permanently. A study out of the University of California in Santa Cruz places that number much, much higher. The unemployment rate has more than doubled since February. In dark times like these, whether it has to do with a church, a, a, a business, um, or our own personal employment, flexibility trumps planning. We have all heard great stories about the way in which businesses uh, have been flexible, the way they have been creative uh, in facing this pandemic. Breweries and distilleries making sanitizer. Automobile manufacturers producing ventilators. 
airlines repurposing their passenger planes for cargo, online ordering and curbside pickup is helping many restaurants and retail businesses stay afloat and their people employed. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love the new look on Burlingame Avenue and hope that when this pandemic is over, uh, that some, if not all, of that outdoor uh, dining is still available. It makes me feel like I'm in Italy or Spain or maybe even Paris. Creative flexibility speaks to the resilience of the human spirit, to our being creative in the image of our creative God. Another positive outcome of flexibility during the pandemic has been an opportunity for redemptive creativity to be set free. Emily Bug and Billy Lewis had to change their wedding plans on account of uh, what was happening with the pandemic. Instead of postponing until um, next year, like many couples have done, they chose instead to forego the, the lavish ceremony and party and simply went down to City Hall and got married. But that left them with a rather big piece of unfinished business. They still had a $5,000 non-refundable deposit with the caterer. What were they going to do with this? Well, Emily works for a nonprofit that uh, reaches out to uh, those in her community uh, that were mentally ill. So what she and Billy decided to do was to use that money to create 200 Thanksgiving dinners with all of the trimmings, turkey, cranberry sauce, uh, mashed potatoes, stuffing, green beans, pumpkin pudding, uh, maybe even a mince pie. I'm not quite sure about the mince pie. But, but the point is that what they did was they took a, a rather sour moment and redeemed it uh, creatively. I love that story because it bespeaks of one of the most beautiful ways I have ever heard for a married couple to start their life together. Remaining flexible, Mary and Joseph traveled to Egypt. Their flexibility saved the life of baby Jesus. They saved the Savior. In the face of threatening circumstances, a second important thing that Mary and Joseph did was listen and heed the prophecies of late night, 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 night visitors. First, the Magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Then in another dream, Joseph is counseled to flee with his family to Egypt. This year, Prophetic voices have been and are seeking our attention too. We haven't had and haven't been called to heed the counsel of our dreams or night terrors, but instead the prophecies of science and the medical community. Personally, I think listening to that counsel um, has been a wise thing to do. But even as I say that, a truth about science that I learned from Chuck Mink, uh, my chemistry teacher long ago, still rings in my ears. I proclaimed that truth um, at my high school graduation speech um, umpteen million years ago. The exact words I said back then have been ringing in my ears and replaying almost daily. Science is mighty, but it is not, and does not claim to be almighty. This has been an important understanding for me to hold on to, as I have heard science being acclaimed as Savior. 
with an undergraduate degree in physics and great appreciation for the scientific method, I have to tell you, I have just been simply dismayed as I have heard scientific findings being filtered through various political agendas as absolute truth. It seems that many politicians on both sides of the aisle are unaware of a corollary truth regarding the scientific method. This is another statement right out of my high school graduation speech that keeps playing over in my head. I was much smarter back then. This is the statement. Science advances more by denying what is wrong rather than asserting what is right. By reducing and eventually eradicating error rather than by heading towards some preconceived final truth. With conflicting science experts being quoted, most of whom sound to one degree or another credi credible, who are we to trust? Which prophets of science and medicine should we be listening to? Should we trust the ones who are aligned with our political, our particular political position? Well, that sounds consistent, but I'm not sure that that's a good truth test. I think we would be far better to listen most attentively to those in the medical community, those scientists we have learned to trust and rely on over time. And who are they? They are the physicians, the family doctors, and nurse practitioners we know personally, the ones who have always been there to take care of our health needs. Graham told us a couple of weeks ago that prophets tell tough truths and proclaim hilarious hopes. When we feel sick, our own doctors are the ones who can tell us when a cough is just a cough or when it is a sign of something more serious. Their prophetic counsel can help us discern the truth regarding the vaccines that are now becoming available. Their prophetic voices can be trusted to tell us both the tough truths, the side effects, and to proclaim the hilarious hope, herd immunity. If you have concerns about getting vaccinated, when it's your turn, just go talk to your doctor. Through this pandemic, trust and appreciation for the medical community has grown exponentially. I personally have had interaction um, with amazing doctors in our community. I have found them to be humble, helpful, aware of their own limits, and amazingly and surprisingly spiritual. When our own Tom Stodgill visited my older sister Georgia in ICU over at Sutter Health, she experienced Tom's whisper in her ear as the voice of God telling her to come back and live. While listening on a Zoom call with a member of our congregation as she received information about an upcoming procedure, the surgeon, knowing that the patient had asked her pastor uh, to be on the call, ended that very complex uh, consultation by asking us if we would like to pray. We did. And we all did. Our wonderful medical community is being prophetic on behalf of our health and wholeness. In a similar way 
to the way in which dreams were prophetic in the life of Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus. Another truth that Mary and Joseph were dealing with in Bethlehem, and we are being reminded of daily during this pandemic, is the frailty of human life. The infant mortality rate in the first century uh, Roman Empire was about 30%. That means one of three children died before the age of one. Being born was a risky business. As the Gospels describe Mary's pregnancy and her delivery, it appears that it was made circumstantially even more complicated than most. First, there was the long journey by donkey to in the final week of her pregnancy. Then, no room at the inn, only a cold, dark cave and dirty barn animals for a delivery room and a feeding trough for a bassinet. I've thought many times about how difficult that journey must have been from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. I've even thought about how difficult um, a delivery uh, would have been uh, in that situation. But before this year, I, I never thought about how dangerous that birth would have been. So much could have gone wrong for mother and baby. The probability of death for one or both was quite high. The fragility of life would have been front and center for Mary and Joseph as Jesus took his first breath. The fr fragility of life is front and center for all of us this year. We are more aware of our mortality than ever before. I personally have figured out with the help of one of our amazing church members that I am probably no longer a time billionaire. He explained it like this. There are a million seconds in 11 days, a billion seconds in 31 years. Young people are time billionaires. They are the ones who have the most time to invest for the future. Like all of you, I don't know how many seconds I have left. I hope I'm still a um, time multimillionaire. Still, so, the clock is kicking down and will one day reach zero. What the fragility of life has led me to do this year is to value each day, each moment, to reassess how I want to invest my last millions of seconds. My hope is that when we as a nation have finally achieved this herd immunity, that we will be more concerned with the quality of our time investment than we ever have been before. But we don't have to wait to then. Time is a gift that needs to be managed and converted into goods and services daily, or we waste it. As we approach the new year, we can be intentionally investing our time for eternal significance right this very second. We can invest, not waste, the valuable gift of time that we have all been given. Mary did, Joseph did that very thing. He took time to listen to his dream and travel south to Egypt, preserving the billion seconds that God had given Jesus to invest for humanity to the glory of God. Another and final lesson that Joseph and Mary experienced that we too are experiencing is global interconnectedness. Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem for the Roman census. 
The Magi came to pay homage to the baby Jesus from the Far East. Joseph took Mary and Jesus to Egypt to keep them safe. So let's just look at this for a second. Rome is in Europe. Bethlehem is in the Middle East. The Magi came from East Asia. Egypt is in Africa. That was the whole known world in first century Israel. From the beginning, Jesus' birth was a global event. The world we now live in is also global like never before. Around the world, we are all experiencing and fighting this same pandemic. We are experiencing our interconnectedness and interdependence in unprecedented ways. What each of us does matters and has potential for being a positive or a negative in the lives of a multitude of other people. An event in the fall of 2019, somewhere in Wuhan, either in a laboratory or in a market, eventuated in the entire world um, undergoing a deadly virus attack. From that single event, there have been worldwide close to 80 million cases and 2 million deaths. It is an illustration of the butterfly effect in operation. The butterfly effect was first discovered in 1963 by a meteorologist named Edward Lawrence. He reported on this butterfly effect at a meeting of the New York Academy of Science with these words. When a butterfly flutters its wings in one part of the world, it can eventually cause a hurricane in another. In time, the butterfly effect became um, accorded the status of a law, and it has been found operating not just in weather systems, but in a wide variety of non-linear systems, such as geology, biology, finance, philosophy, physics, politics, psychology, and robotics. We have seen and experienced the butterfly effect this year as a small virus set free in far off Wuhan, more than 6,000 miles away in eight time zones, has caused a deadly pandemic here in California and everywhere else around the world. Lawrence, in a more positive twist, later said, if the flap of a butterfly's wings can be instrumental in generating a tornado, it can equally well be instrumental in preventing a tornado. The birth of Jesus was the ultimate positive butterfly effect event. The most pointed and beautiful articulation of this effect was penned almost a century ago in a poem that I am sure that you have heard, that you have read, or maybe even sent out in Christmas cards. I close with it this morning because it is in this event that all that we have experienced this year can be transformed. It is our hope. The poem is called One Solitary Life. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book, 
He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of humankind's progress. All of the armies that ever marched, all of the navies that have ever sailed, all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of humankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. It is that life we celebrate at Christmas. That life in whom we place our trust and our hope. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, hope wins. God wins. We win. May it be. Amen.